Welcome 8th graders, welcome to our first uh, class of the week as we continue to talk about the Great Depression and today we're going to talk uh, very briefly about what was life like for the average American uh, during the Great Depression. So uh, just keep in mind that I'll be posting videos throughout the week and that I'll be having some assignments for you guys that I will always make sure that you have are keeping informed. As you go through... Uh, the week, make sure you're staying up to date with Google Classroom. This is where I will be having all of my videos being posted, okay? You, if you haven't subscribed yet, uh, make sure you subscribe. We will be posting videos uh, pretty regularly, okay? So let's talk a little bit more about the Great Depression. More specifically, life in the Great Depression for the average American. Here's the one problem when you talk about average people. That's a really subjective term, isn't it? You probably describe yourself as an average person. I describe myself as average, okay? I'm an average American. And you know what the problem is? Is that like 80% of Americans would describe themselves as average Americans. So it's kind of hard for us to talk about uh, what was life like for the average American because that's a very uh, hard term to define. So instead of talking about like a subjective fictional person, I'm going to instead talk about different groups of people and what, what life was like for those people living in the United States during the Great Depression from 1930 all the way up to the beginning of World War II for the United States. And let's talk uh, specifically uh, to begin with, with the people living in the Northeast, specifically people living in places like New York and uh, Boston, those big industrial centers of the North, Pittsburgh, uh, uh, Philadelphia, those sorts of areas. The problem with the Great Depression wasn't just that the stock market had tanked. It also led to businesses just closing. Of course, when any time a business closed, it's not just the fact that we're not going to get those uh, different types of items that we enjoy in our everyday life. They also have hundreds and hundreds of jobs. Uh, and so when we talk about a unemployment rate during this point, the average national uh, unemployment rate was 25%. One out of every four Americans. That's crazy. Uh, that is what made the Depression so great. Uh, in a bad way and so unique was that the unemployment rate was staggering compared to other financial crises. The problem is that that's the national average, one out of four. Instead, what we should look at is some areas, especially in the urban areas, where people uh, were being laid off in massive quantities. Uh, and so the unemployment rates in New York were much more severe. This would lead to homelessness. This would lead to bread and soup lines. Probably one of the uh, greatest uh, images of the Great Depression is the image of people lined up for miles and miles uh, looking for soup and bread at uh, uh, bread lines. Uh, as the Great Depression uh, worsened, more and more people were evicted from their homes and they would uh, create what was called Hoovervilles. These were ramshackled camps made of cardboard and scrap wood and sheet metal uh, where people lived in these tiny little houses crunched together at certain spots that they were allowed to. You know, public parks were used. The outside of cities were common places. Um, also, what was very uh, common in the Great Depression was people wandering great exoduses of people. This is actually, when we talk a little bit in a few minutes about farmers, this is what leads to uh, uh, one of the greatest American novels ever written, in my opinion. But people were looking for work. People were looking for jobs. And so life uh, in this time period was greatly uncertain. So that's kind of like an idea of what you have for people in the industrial area. But let's talk a little bit about the people in agricultural areas. Well, it wasn't much better. For the most part, farmers in the United States were, had, were having a tougher time even than the people in the industrial areas. Why was that? Well, it comes down to World War I. During World War I, the majority of people had been, uh, who were farmers had been producing crops uh, en masse to, for the war effort. Not only were they feeding 
uh, American civilians. They are feeding American troops, but they were also feeding the allied countries that were fighting with the United States. And so what that leads to is that they're building more and more machines to harvest more and more crops, which means that they can sell it at higher and higher prices because demand is so high. Well, what happens when the demand goes away? Well, for the farmers, that means that the prices plummet, which of course means that they no longer have the ability to uh, uh, afford the machinery and technology that they had uh, become accustomed to. And so a lot of farms were foreclosed on. What that means is that the banks started owning them. And so people were uh, pushed out of their farms. Another huge event that coincided with uh, the Great Depression was the Dust Bowl. And so the Dust Bowl was a result of a massive drought that took place over the course of uh, several years from the mid-20s all the way to the early 30s. What made it the Dust Bowl was that basically the topsoil of areas in North Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, Iowa, all those big farming uh, states, the topsoil was so dry and dead that the winds took it. And the, the Dust Bowl was characterized by gigantic dust storms that covered the Midwest. Homes would be full of dust. And I'm not talking about like uh, maybe the dust that you see like on your windowsill. I'm talking about a home filled to the brim with dust. Dust going up six feet and covering the windows. It's so bad that it's almost like it's snowing with dust. Now, for a lot of people, you would probably say this is the end of the world. And there's very little incentive for staying in these Midwestern states. And so, the majority of them pack up everything that they own, get in their cars, and drive. Where do they drive? They drive to the only place they know that could put possibly or potentially have work, and that's California. These people were called Okies. The majority of them come from Oklahoma. Oklahoma was one of the areas where the Dust Bowl was hit the most severely. However, Okies just became kind of like a mm, term for uh, the majority of people who were traveling, those agricultural workers. And this is where uh, the novel... The Grapes of Wrath comes in uh, by John Steinbeck. If you ever get a chance, um, I would imagine that you guys will either read some Steinbeck. You may have already read some Steinbeck with Ms. Bray. Um, but if you ever get a chance, read some Steinbeck novels. Uh, it's one of my favorite authors. Steinbeck wrote The Grapes of Wrath, which is about families moving from Oklahoma to California and all the troubles that they had in the way. Of course... Um, these people were not treated very well by the towns that they went through. It's the same way that we treat homeless people today. Um, usually not well. They're not welcomed. Uh, and a lot of violence was done against the Okies as they were moving across to California. They get to California, and instead of, you know, a promised land like Canaan with rivers of milk and honey, instead uh, it's overcrowded, and it has uh, work for them to pick in fruit orchards, you know, peaches, oranges, apples, grapes. Problem is, is that there's so many people there and they're desperate. And so these larger companies that were owning these orchards uh, in California were able to get people to work for them without uh, paying them much. So for instance, uh, people would pick uh, a basket of peaches and they get paid a quarter for their work. Now, a quarter had a lot more buying power back then, but still, uh, it's very small wages for a whole day's work of picking peaches in the California sun. Basically, what we look at in this situation is people are have a desperation. Now, a question that you might have to yourself, well, Mr. Happy, why didn't the New Deal uh, solve this? The problem is, is that the New Deal, while making a lot of changes that become beneficial to the United States later on in its time period, is nowhere near enough to end the Depression. The Great Depression was an unprecedented economic disaster. Okay? Unprecedented economic disaster. 
And the big problem was is that the government was just not big enough to handle it. We talk a lot in modern day politics about the size of the federal government. And we talk about how the federal government is involved in a lot of aspects of human life in the United States. This was not so much the case in the 1930s. The federal government was not as involved. The New Deal changes that, and the federal government becomes more and more involved. But basically what ends the Depression is World War II, the massive government spending, and the massive, most importantly, the massive employment opportunities that are needed for the war effort. How, what, what were some lasting effects of the Great Depression? Well, you have a sizable population shift huge population shift from the Midwest to areas like California. Um, you have the beginnings of what's called the Rust Belt. Um, areas uh, in Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, Illinois, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, where manufacturing uh, begins to move. For the most part, up from the Civil War all the way up to the uh, basically 1970s, Manufacturing jobs were widespread throughout those Midwestern states. Eventually, those leave. Uh, in the Great Depression, you see some of the first really big uh, movements of those to cheaper areas. Another big part of the Great Depression is, and a great lasting impact of the Great Depression, is the desire for people to have the federal government get involved. Uh, when disasters strike in modern day America, we look at the federal government for their response to a disaster. What is the president going to do? What is Congress going to do? They need to do something, right? That was different. That was very a very different mindset back in the 1930s. People didn't really see the federal government as that being their job. Roosevelt changes this and has a much more uh, important role for the federal government. The federal government becomes a uh, interventionist government where when things are happening and there are problems the federal government is not going to rely on charity the federal government is not going to rely on the states the federal government is going to take action this is a fundamental change in the way americans see themselves and they say they go from the federal government is supposed to just stay out of the way and instead the federal government is supposed to ensure life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's where we're going to end today, uh, Life in the Great Depression. I hope you guys are uh, keep it up with reading in uh, chapter 26. Um, the only thing I want you guys to do uh, for an assignment today is to comment below in our Google Classroom with a question um, or a uh, comment that you have about the video, something that uh, you uh, enjoy about this or maybe there's something more specifically about the Great Depression that you'd like me to answer in our questions and answers video tomorrow. I uh, am looking forward to uh, looking at all of your engagement. A reminder, uh, you can uh, subscribe to me if you have a YouTube account. You can subscribe to Mr. H on YouTube uh, and if your parents want to be involved and watch the videos with you, they can also go on to uh, Facebook and look at Mr. H on YouTube. Uh, keep on uh, uh, with all your feedback, guys, and I'm looking forward to enjoying some uh, beautiful sunshine weather this Monday. See you guys uh, tomorrow. Bye-bye.